Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. The day was Sunday, November 3rd, and soon the three great powers of their school year, Harry Potter, Draco Malfoy, and Hermione Granger, would begin their struggle for supreme dominance. Harry was slightly annoyed by the way the boy who lived had been demoted from supreme dominance to one of three equal rivals just by entering the contest, but he expected to get it back soon. The battleground was a section of non-forbidden forest, dense with trees, because Professor Quirrell thought that being able to see all the enemy forces was too boring, even for your very first battle. All the students who were not actually in a first-year army were camped out nearby and watching on screens that Professor Quirrell had set up. Except for three Gryffindors in their fourth year, who were currently sick and confined to healer's beds by Madame Pomfrey. Aside from that, everyone was there. The students were dressed, not in their ordinary school robes, but in muggle camouflage uniforms that Professor Quirrell had obtained somewhere, and had supplied in sufficient quantity and variety to fit everyone. It wasn't that students would have worried about stains and rips, that was what charms were for. But as Professor Quirrell had explained to the surprised wizardborns, nice, dignified clothing was not efficient for hiding in forests or dodging around trees. Harry had tried to get the name Dragon Army. Draco had pitched a fit and said that would confuse everyone completely. Professor Quirrell had ruled that Draco could lay prior claim to the name if he wished. So now, Harry was fighting Dragon Army. Harry, after considering alternate choices like the 501st Provisional Battalion and Harry's Minions O'Doom, had decided that his army would be known by the simple and dignified appellation of the Chaos Legion. Harry had earnestly advised Hermione that the young boys serving under her were probably nervous about her being a girl with a reputation for being nice, and that she should pick something scary that would reassure them of her toughness and make them proud to be part of her army, like the Blood Commandos or something. Hermione had named her army the Sunshine Regiment, and in ten minutes they would be at war. Harry smiled, because he understood what this part of Professor Quirrell's master plan was about, and Harry was taking full advantage of it for his own purposes, too. There was a legendary episode in social psychology called the Robber's Cave Experiment. The scientists had set up a summer camp for 22 boys from 22 different schools, selecting them to all be from stable, middle-class families. The first phase of the experiment had been intended to investigate what it took to start a conflict between groups. The 22 boys had been divided into two groups of 11, and this had been quite sufficient. They'd named themselves the Eagles and the Rattlers. They hadn't needed names for themselves when they thought they were the only ones in the park, and had proceeded to develop contrasting group stereotypes. The other part of the experiment had been testing how to resolve group conflicts. Bringing the boys together to watch fireworks hadn't worked at all. They just shouted at each other and stayed apart. What had worked was warning them that there might be vandals in the park, and the two groups needing to work together to solve a failure of the park's water system. A common task, a common enemy. Harry had a strong suspicion Professor Quirrell had understood this principle very well indeed when he had chosen to create three armies per year. Three armies. Not four. And definitely not segregated by house. Except that no Slytherins had been assigned to Draco besides Mr. Crab and Mr. Goyle. 
It was things like this which reassured Harry that Professor Quirrell, despite his affected dark atmosphere and his pretense at neutrality in the conflict between good and evil, was secretly backing good. Not that Harry would ever dare say that out loud. And Harry had decided to take full advantage of Professor Quirrell's plan to define a group identity his way. The Rattlers, once they'd met the Eagles, had started thinking of themselves as rough and tough, and they'd conducted themselves accordingly. The Eagles had thought of themselves as good and proper. And in that bright forest clearing, scattered around the old and rotting tree stumps, outlined in the sun shining down brilliantly from above, General Potter and his 23 soldiers were arranged in nothing remotely resembling a formation. It was the Chaos Legion, after all. And if there wasn't a reason to stand in neat little lines, Harry had said disdainfully, there weren't going to be neat little lines. Harry had divided his army into six squads of four soldiers each, each squad commanded by a squad suggester. All troops were under strict orders to disobey any orders they were given if it seemed like a good idea at the time, including that one, unless Harry or the squad suggester prefixed the order with Merlin says, in which case you were supposed to actually obey. The Chaos Legion's chief attack was to split up and run in from multiple directions, randomly changing vectors and firing the approved sleep spell as rapidly as you could rebuild magical strength. And if you saw a chance to distract or confuse the enemy, you took it. Fast. Creative. Unpredictable. Non-homogenous. Don't just obey orders, think about whether what you're doing right now makes sense. Harry wasn't quite as sure as he'd pretended that this was the optimum of military efficiency but he'd been given a golden opportunity to change how some students thought about themselves, and that was how he intended to use it. All wings report in! Red lead all standing by! said Seamus Finnegan, who had no idea what it meant. Red five standing by! said Dean Thomas, who'd waited his entire life to say it. Green leader standing by! Green 41 standing by! I want you in the air the instant we hear the bell. Do not engage. Repeat. Do not engage. Evade if under fire. Of course, you did not aim sleep spells at broomsticks. You fired a spell that gave a temporary red glow to whatever it hit. If you hit the broomstick or the rider, they were out of the war. Red leader and red five, fly towards Malfoy's army as fast as you can. Stay as high as you can while still seeing them. Return the instant you know for sure what they're doing. Green leader, do the same for Granger's army. Green 41, fly above us and watch for any approaching broomsticks or soldiers. You and only you are authorized to fire. And remember, I didn't say Merlin says for any of that, but we really do need the information. Draco's moves would be in his own self-interest. He would predictably ready his army to defend against Hermione. He might or might not realize that Harry had been lying about waiting to attack until after that battle finished. But General Granger was the unpredictable one, and Harry couldn't move until he knew how she was moving. Harry expected Hermione to launch an immediate attack on Draco, in which case he'd move his troops into position and start supporting her, but only after she'd taken severe losses and caused some damage. He would frame it as a heroic rescue, if possible. It wouldn't do to have Sunshine thinking that Chaos wasn't their friend, after all. General Malfoy looked out on his troops with calm satisfaction. Six units of three troops each. The aerial unit of four, to which Gregory was assigned, and the command unit, which was himself and Vincent. They'd only drilled for a short time on the previous Sunday, but Drake was confident that he'd managed to explain the basics. Stay with your mates, watch their back and trust them to watch yours. Move as a single body. Obey orders and show no fear. Aim, fire, move. Aim again, fire again. They already looked remarkably like the Oro units whose training Draco had watched during his father's inspections. Chaos and Sunshine weren't going to know what hit them. Draco had protested at first about not being assigned any Slytherins, and Professor Quirrell had told him that if he wanted to be the first Malfoy to gain complete political control of the country, he needed to learn how to govern the other three quarters of the population. It was things like this which reassured Draco that Professor Quirrell had a great deal more sympathy for the good guys than Professor Quirrell was letting on. The actual battle wouldn't be easy, especially if Granger did attack the dragons first. Draco had agonized over whether to commit all his forces against Granger immediately in a preemptive strike, but had worried that, one, Harry had been misleading him completely about what Granger was likely to do, and two, Harry had been misleading him about waiting until after Granger's attack to join the battle. The battle is about to begin. Remember everything I and Mr. Crab and Mr. Goyle showed you. 
An army wins because it is disciplined and deadly. General Potter and the Chaos Legion will not be disciplined. Granger and the Sunshine Regiment will not be deadly. We are disciplined. We are deadly. We are dragons. The battle is about to begin, and we are about to win it. My troops, I'm not going to lie to you. Our situation today is very grim. Dragon Army has never lost a single battle, and Hermione Granger has a very good memory. The truth is, most of you are probably going to die, and the survivors will envy the dead. But we have a better reason to fight than they do. We fight because we like it. We fight to amuse eldritch monstrosities from beyond space and time. We fight because we're chaos. And remember, your goal isn't just to cut down the enemy, it's to make them afraid. A great booming gong echoed over the forest. And the Sunshine Regiment began to march. The tension rose and rose as Harry and the 19 other soldiers who remained waited for the aerial warriors to report back. It shouldn't take long. Broomsticks were fast and the distances in the forest were not great. Two broomsticks approached at speed from the direction of Draco's camp, and all the soldiers tensed. They weren't executing the maneuvers that were today's code for a friendly broomstick. SCATTER AND FIRE! And then, as soon as Harry was among the trees, he spun back, raised his wand, tried to seek out the broomstick in the sky... CLEAR! THEY'RE HEADING BACK! Harry gave a mental shrug. There'd been no way to prevent Draco from obtaining that information, and he'd only learned that they'd been standing still and the Chaotix slowly emerged from the forest. Broomstick approaching from Granger's direction! I think it's Green Leader! He did the dip and roll! Moments later, Theodore Knott dived out of the sky and pulled up in the midst of the soldiers. Granger has divided her forces in two! She's attacking both armies! Two brooms covering each force! They pursued me halfway here! Divided her army? What on earth? Then Harry realized... She's being fair. It was going to be a long year in defense class. Draco listened to the flyer's reports with his face calm, all his shock concealed inside. What could Granger possibly be thinking? Then Draco realized. It's a feint. One of Sunshine's two forces would change direction, and both would converge on... Who? Neville Longbottom marched through the forest toward the approaching sunny force, occasionally glancing up at the sky for broomsticks. Behind him marched his squad comrades, Melvin Coote and Lavender Brown of Gryffindor, and Alan Flint of Slytherin. Alan Flint was their squad suggester, though Harry had first said to Neville, in private, that the position was his if he wanted it. And Neville softly began to sing the Song of Chaos. The tune was what a muggle would have identified as John Williams' Imperial March, also known as Darth Vader's theme, and the words Harry had added were easy to remember. Doom, 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 By the second line, the others had joined in, and soon you could hear the same soft chant coming from nearby parts of the forest. Harry had said quite a lot of things to Neville in private, starting with, You know, Neville, if you want to become as awesome as the imaginary Neville who lives in your head, but isn't allowed to do anything because you're scared, then you really should sign up for Professor Quirrell's armies. And Harry's promise had come true. This did feel different from sparring in defense class. And Neville marched alongside his fellow Chaos Legionnaires, strange feelings stirring in his heart, imagination becoming reality, as from his lips poured a fearful song of doom. Harry stared at the bodies scattered across the forest. Something inside him felt a bit queasy, and he had to remind himself hard that they were only sleeping. There were girls among the fallen, and that made it a lot worse somehow, and he would have to be careful never to mention that in front of Hermione, or the Aurors would find his remains stuffed into a small teapot. Half of Sunshine Army hadn't put up much of a fight against all of Chaos. Hermione wasn't among the fallen. Draco must have gotten her, and that was making Harry feel angry on some completely incomprehensible level. He wasn't sure if he was feeling protective toward Hermione, or cheated that he hadn't been the one to do it. Or maybe both. Alright, let's everyone be clear on one thing. That wasn't a real fight. That was General Granger making a mistake in her first battle. 
Today's actual fight is with Dragon Army, and it's not going to be anything like this. It's going to be a lot more fun. Let's move out. A broomstick fell out of the sky, approaching terrifyingly fast, and spun on its end and decelerated so hard you could almost hear the air screaming in protest, and came to a halt directly beside Draco. It wasn't dangerous showing off. Gregory Goyle simply was that good, and he didn't waste time. Potter's coming. They've still got all four of their brooms. You want me to take them out? No. Fighting over their army gives them too much of an advantage. They'll fire on you from the ground, and even you might not be able to dodge it all. Wait until the forces engage. Draco had lost four dragons in exchange for twelve sunnies. Apparently, General Granger actually had been that incredibly stupid. Though she hadn't been among the attackers, so Draco hadn't gotten a chance to taunt her or ask her what in Merlin's name she had been thinking. The true battle, they all knew, would be with Harry Potter. Prepare yourselves! Stay together with your mates! Act as a unit! Fire as soon as the enemy is in range! Discipline against chaos. It shouldn't be much of a fight. The adrenaline was pumping and pumping into Neville's blood until he felt like he could hardly breathe. We're closing in! Time to spread out! Neville's comrades moved away from him. They would still support each other, but if you clustered together, the enemy would have a much easier time hitting you. Fire aimed at one of your comrades might miss and get you instead. You would be a lot harder to hit if you spread out and moved as fast as you could. It still bothered Neville a little not to be marching side by side with his comrades, but the scary battle cries they'd learned were already thundering in his head and that made up for a lot. This time, Neville silently vowed to himself, his voice was absolutely positively not going to squeak. Shields up! Power to forward deflectors! Contigo! A sharp taste filled Neville's mouth. General Potter wouldn't have ordered them to cast shields unless they were almost in range. Neville could see the uniformed shapes of dragons moving through the dense screens of trees, and the dragons would be seeing them as well. Attack! Charge! All the adrenaline in Neville's blood was unleashed and his legs took over, sending him flying faster than he'd ever run before, straight toward the enemy, knowing without needing to look that all his comrades were doing the same. Blood for the Blood God! Skulls for the Skull Throne! Yeah! Shove nigger off! The enemy's gate is sideways! There was a soundless impact as a sleep spell wasted itself against Neville's shield. If there'd been other spells fired, they hadn't hit. Neville saw the brief look of fear on Wayne Hopkins' face as he stood besides two Gryffindors Neville didn't recognize, and then Neville dropped the simple shield and fired at Wayne. Missed. His racing legs went straight past the enemy grouping and toward another three dragons, their wands coming up on him, their mouths opening. Not even thinking about it, Neville dived down to the forest floor just as the three voices cried Somnium! And then Neville, with sudden insight, lay still and closed his eyes. Stop! Don't shoot us, we're dragons! With a flash of glorious satisfaction, Neville realized that he'd managed to get between two groups of dragons just as one group had fired on him. Harry had talked about this as a tactic for making the enemy afraid to fire, but apparently it worked a bit better than that. And not only that, the dragons believed they'd gotten him, since they'd seen Neville fall just as they fired. Neville counted to twenty inside his head, then opened his eyes a crack. The three dragons were very near him, all three had simple shields up now. Neville's wand was still in his hand, and it didn't take much effort to point it at one boy's boots and whisper, Somnium. Neville quickly closed his eyes and relaxed his hand as he heard the boy fall to the ground. Where'd it come from? Reform ranks. To me, everyone. Don't let them scatter you. Neville's ears heard the two dragons actually jump over his prone body as they ran off. Neville opened his eyes, pushed himself to his feet a bit painfully, and then pointed his wand and said the new charm that General Potter had taught them all. Ventriloquo, whispered Neville, pointing the wand to one side of Justin and the other boy, and then yelled, FOR CTHULHU AND GLORY! Justin and the other boy stopped abruptly, turning their shields toward where Neville had moved his battle cry, and that was when multiple cries of, SOMNIUM, filled the air, and the other boy dropped before Neville was finished aiming. That last one's mine! yelled Neville, and then he started sprinting straight toward Justin, who'd been mean to him until the older Hufflepuff straightened him out. Neville was surrounded by his comrades, and that meant... 
Special attack! Chaotic leap! Howled Neville as he ran, and felt his body lighten, then lighten twice again as his comrades got their wand turned toward him and quietly cast the Hover Charm. And Neville raised his left hand and snapped his fingers and then used his legs to push off the ground as hard as he could and soared through the air. Sheer shock painted Justin's face as Neville went over the other boy's shield and pointed his wand down at the form passing beneath him and cried, Somnium! Because he'd felt like it, that was why. Neville didn't quite get his feet turned around properly and rather plowed into the ground as he landed. But two out of three of the other Chaos Legionnaires had managed to hold their wands on him throughout and he didn't hit very hard. And Neville got to his feet, panting. He knew he should be moving. People were yelling Somnium all over the place. I am Neville, the last Zion of Longbottom! Neville of Chaos! Face me if you dare! When Neville woke up afterward, he was told that Dragon Army had taken this as their cue to counterattack. The girl beside Harry slumped to the ground, taking the shot meant for him, and he could hear Mr. Goyle's distant gloating laugh as his broomstick blasted past them. Chaos had only six soldiers left now, and the Dragon Army had two, and the only problem was that one of these soldiers was invincible, and the other one was using up three soldiers just to cover him inside his shield. They'd lost more soldiers to Mr. Goyle than all the other dragons put together and he was weaving and dodging through the air so fast that no one could hit him, and he could shoot people while he did that. Harry had thought of all sorts of ways to stop Mr. Goyle, but none of them were safe, and that was getting harder and harder to remember as Harry's blood froze over. It's a game. You're not trying to kill him. Don't throw away all your future plans for a game. Harry could see the pattern. He could see how Mr. Goyle was weaving. He could see how and when they all needed to fire in order to create a web of shots that Mr. Goyle wouldn't be able to dodge. But he just hadn't been able to explain it fast enough to his soldiers. They couldn't coordinate their shots well enough, and now they didn't have enough people left to do it. I refuse to lose. Not like this. Not my whole army to one soldier. Mr. Goyle's broomstick turned faster than anything should have been able to turn and started to angle in toward Harry and his surviving troops. He could sense the boy beside him tensing, getting ready to throw himself in front of his general. Screw this! Harry's wand came up, focusing on Mr. Goyle. Harry's mind visualized the pattern, and Harry's lips opened and his voice screamed, Luminous! 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 Slowly, Harry sat up. His magic was aching. A strange sensation, but not an entirely unpleasant one, much like the burn and lethargy that followed hard physical exercise. Right. He hadn't been hit by a sleep hex, just exhausted himself. So when he woke up, he was still in the game. Harry suspected he was going to get a lecture from someone or other about not exhausting his magic to the point of unconsciousness over a children's game. But he hadn't hurt Mr. Goyle when he'd lost his temper, and that was the important thing. Where's the fifth soldier? Um, I fired a sleep hex at the shield, and it bounced off and hit Lavender. I mean, the angle shouldn't have been right, but it did. Draco was smirking inside the shield. So, let me guess. Those neat little trios are the formations used by professional magical militaries? Made up of trained soldiers who can easily hit moving targets if their own hands are steady, and who can combine their defensive powers so long as they stay together? Unlike your soldiers? It just goes to show that you should always question everything you see your role model is doing and ask why it's being done, and whether it makes sense in context for you to do it too. Don't forget to apply that advice to real life, by the way. And thanks for the slow-moving clustered targets. Because Draco had already gotten that lecture, and, Harry suspected, discounted it out of suspicion that Harry was trying to shift his loyalties further away from pure-blood tradition. Which, of course, Harry was. But this example would make an excellent excuse, next Saturday, to claim that questioning authority was a merely practical technique for real life. You haven't won yet, General Potter. Maybe we'll run out of time and Professor Coral will call it a draw. A fair and worrisome point. The war only ended when Professor Quirrell, in his personal judgment, decided one army had won by practical, real-world standards. There was no formal victory condition, Professor Quirrell had explained, because then Harry would figure out how to game the rules. Harry had to admit this was a fair cop. 
and Harry couldn't blame Professor Quirrell for not calling an end because it was plausible that the last soldier of Dragon Army could take out all five survivors of the Chaos Legion. All right. Does anyone know anything about General Malfoy's shield spell? It developed that Draco's shield was a version of the standard Protego, which had several disadvantages, the most important of which was that the shield couldn't move with the caster. The upside, or from Harry's perspective, downside, was that it was easier to learn, easier to cast, and much easier to sustain for long times. They would need to hammer the shield with attack spells in order to bring it down, and Draco could apparently exert some control over the angle of reflection at which the spells would bounce off. The thought occurred to Harry that they could use Wingardium Leviosa to pile up heavy rocks on the shield until Draco couldn't sustain it against the pressure, but then the rocks might fall in afterward and hit Draco, and injuring the enemy general for real was not among today's goals. And that was when a spiral of green energy shot out of the forest and smashed into Draco's shield. Did anyone see where that came from? And General Malfoy, would you mind telling me if you got General Granger? Why yes, I mind. Oh, hell. Harry's mind began calculating. Draco inside the shield, Draco worn out now to some degree, Harry worn out too, Hermione in the woods who knew where, Harry and four other Chaotix left. You know, General Granger, you really should have waited to attack until after I'd fought General Malfoy. You might have been able to get all the survivors. From somewhere came a girl's high-pitched laughter. <laughs> Harry froze. That wasn't Hermione. And that was when the dreadful, eerie, cheerful rant began to rise, coming from all around them. Granger cheated. She woke up her soldiers. Why doesn't Professor Quarrel? Let me guess. It was a very easy battle, right? They dropped like flies? Yes, we got them all on the first shot. The look of horrified realization spread from Draco to the Chaos Legionnaires. No, we didn't. Camouflaged forms were appearing among the trees. Allies? Allies. A spiral of green energy blazed out of the woods and shattered Draco's shield to splinters. General Granger surveyed the battlefield with a definite feeling of satisfaction. She was down to nine Sunshine soldiers, but that was probably enough to handle the last survivor, especially when Pavarotti and Anthony and Ernie were already holding their wands on General Potter, whom she'd ordered taken alive. Well, conscious. It was bad, she knew, but she'd really, really, really wanted to gloat. There's a trick, isn't there? There has to be some trick. You can't just turn into a perfect general. Not on top of everything else. You're not that Slytherin. You don't write creepy poetry. No one's that good at everything. General Granger glanced around at her sunshine soldiers, then looked back at Harry. Everyone was probably watching this on the screens outside. And General Granger said, I can do anything if I study hard enough. Oh, now that's just bull- Somnium. Harry slumped to the ground in mid-sentence. Sunshine wins, intoned the huge voice of Professor Quirrell, seeming to come from everywhere and nowhere. Niceness has triumphed. Hooray! And what's the moral of today's battle? We, we can, can do, do anything, anything if we study hard enough! And the survivors of the Sunshine Regiment marched off toward the victory field, singing their marching song as they went. Don't be frightened, don't be sad, we'll only hurt you if you're bad. And send you to a home that is true with new friends to watch over you. Be sure to tell them you were sent by Ranger Sunshine Regiment. Harry paced backward and forward in his general's office, which made a wonderful room for pacing. It didn't have any other uses as far as he could tell. How? How? Hermione shouldn't have won that battle. Not on her first try. Not when she wasn't at all violent by nature. Automatically being a great military commander on top of everything else was too much even for her. Had Professor Quirrell broken his promise not to help her? Had he given her the diary of General Tacticus or something? Harry was missing something here, something really important, and his mind went around and around in circles and he still couldn't figure it out. 
Finally, Harry sighed. He wasn't getting anywhere on this, and he had to go learn the breaking drill hex from Hermione or someone before the next battle. Plus, Harry also needed to figure out how to bring down Mr. Goyle next time. Battles counted for a lot of Quirrell points if you were a general, and Harry needed to get cracking if he wanted to win Professor Quirrell's Christmas wish. Draco Malfoy stared off into space as though the wall in front of his desk was the most fascinating surface in the world. How? How? In retrospect, it had been an obvious sort of idea as cunning plots went, but Granger wasn't supposed to be cunning. She'd been too much of a Hufflepuff to use a simple strike hex. Had Professor Quirrell been advising her despite his promise? Or... Your strength as a rationalist is your ability to be more confused by fiction than by reality. Draco was confused. Therefore, something he believed was fiction. Granger should not have been able to do all that. Therefore, she probably hadn't. I promise not to help General Granger any way that the two of you don't know about. With sudden, horrified realization, Draco swept papers out of the way, hunting through the mess on his desk until he found it. And there it was, right in the list of people and equipment assigned to each of the three armies. Curse Professor Quirrell! Draco had read it and he still hadn't seen it. How long do you think it'll take Malfoy to figure it out? Not long. He may have already. How long will it take Potter to figure it out? Forever. Unless Malfoy tells him, or one of his own soldiers realizes. Harry Potter just doesn't think like that. Really? I mean, it seems kind of obvious to me. Who would try to come up with all the ideas just by themselves? Malfoy. Harry. Malfoy thinks he's way better than everyone else. And Harry doesn't really see most other people like that. It was kind of sad, actually. Harry had grown up very, very alone. It wasn't that he went around thinking in words that only geniuses had a right to exist. It just wouldn't occur to him that anyone in Hermione's army besides Hermione could have any good ideas. Anyhow, Captains Goldstein and Weasley, you're on duty for thinking up strategic ideas for our next battle. Captains McMillan and Susan, sorry, I mean McMillan and Bones, try to come up with some tactics we can use, also any training you think we should try. Oh, and congratulations on your marching song, Captain Goldstein. I think it was a big plus for Esprit de Corps. What are you doing? And Colonel Sabini? Hermione stood up out of her chair, stretching. <sighs> I'll try to figure out what Harry Potter is thinking, and Colonel Zabini will try to figure out what Draco Malfoy might do. And both of us will join you again after we come up with something. I'm going to walk while I think. Zabini, you want to come along? Yes, General. It hadn't been meant as an order. Hermione sighed to herself a little. This was going to take some getting used to, and although Zabini's first idea had certainly worked, she wasn't quite sure that Professor Quirrell's, quote, mixture of positive and negative incentives, unquote, would be enough to keep the Slytherin fully on her side until December when traitors would be allowed for the first time. She still had no idea what she was going to do with Professor Quirrell's Christmas wish either. Maybe she'd just ask Mandy if she wanted anything when the time came around.